Liebes Publikum, herzlich willkommen in der LVZ Autoren Arena. Ein kleiner Hinweis, das nächste Gespräch wird auf Englisch äh, stattfinden. Ich werde aber zwischendurch das immer ähm, auf Deutsch zusammenfassen. Neben mir sitzen Michael Robotham, australischer ähm, Schriftsteller, ehemaliger Ghostwriter und Journalist und Verfasser von zahlreichen Psychothrillern und sein deutscher Hörbuchsprecher und Schauspieler Ulrich Nöten, der jetzt auch gleich zu Beginn einige Passagen aus dem neuesten Buch Todeswunsch vorlesen wird. Darin geht es um die 16-jährige frühreife Sienna, die in den Verdacht gerät, ihren Vater ermordet zu haben. Und der Psychologe Joe O'Lucklin beginnt zu ermitteln, weil sie auch die, ähm, die Freundin seiner, seiner Tochter ist. Und er hat schon bald Zweifel daran, dass sie ihren Vater wirklich ermordet hat. Welcome, Mr. Robotham. Herzlich willkommen, Ulrich Nöten. Gut, dann fange ich, ich fange einfach mal an zu lesen ein bisschen. Ja, yeah, he's going to start reading. Okay. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've decided. I'll go first. Ah. All right. Um, as you've probably explained, this is narrated by Joe O'Loughlin, who's a psychologist, my main character. I look at my watch. It's not quite ten. There's still time for an evening stroll to the Fox and Badger, the village pub. Collecting my coat, I step out the door and turn along the high street. A few minutes later, I pull open the heavy door, smell the beer fumes. The pub is noisy and energetic, full of lumpy bodies and flushed faces, locals, regulars. Most of them I recognize, even if I don't know their names. Half a dozen youngsters ta have taken over a corner of the lounge, beneath a string of fairy lights and pheasants. Some of the girls look underage in tight jeans and short tops, brats dolls grown up. The publican Hector raises his eyes and pours me a scotch. One drink won't hurt. I'll start my new regime tomorrow, show Mr. Parkinson who's the better man. Hector is the unofficial convener of the local divorce men's club, which meets once a month at the pub. I'm not a natural joiner, and since I'm technically not divorced, I've avoided most of the meetings, but I do play in the pub's over 35s football team. There are 15 of us, a number that allows for frequent substitutions and prevents avoidable heart attacks. I play defence. Right back, leaving the faster men to play up front. I like to imagine myself more in the classic European sweeper role, threading precision long balls that split the defence. We have nicknames. I'm known as Shrink, for obvious reasons. Hans is our goalkeeper, a retired pilot who has a brain tumour, and our star striker Jimmy Munro is called Marilyn, but not to his face. They're a reasonable bunch of lads. None of them asks my condition, which is pretty obvious from my miss kicks. After the game, we nurse our bruises at the Fox and Badger, sharing non-confessional personal stories. We don't confide. We never disclose an intimacy. We are men. I finish my drink and have another, nursing it slowly. At 11 o'clock, Hector signals last orders. My mobile is vibrating. It's Julianne, Julianne's Joe's um, wife. I wonder what she's doing up so late. I press the green button and try to say something clever, but she cuts me off. Come quickly, it's Sienna, something's wrong. She's covered in blood, blood. I couldn't make her stay, we have to find her. Where did she go? She just ran away. Well, call 999, I'm coming. I grab my coat from a wooden hook and pull open the door, breaking into a trot as I thread my arms through the sleeves. The pavement slabs are cracked and uneven under my feet. Turning down Mill Hill, I pick up speed, letting gravity carry me towards the cottage in jarring strides. Julianne is waiting outside, a torch swinging frenetically in her hand. Where did she go, I say. She points towards the river, her voice cracking. She rang the doorbell. I screamed when I saw her. I must have scared her. Did she say anything? Julianne shakes her head. The door is open behind her. I can see Charlie sitting on the stairs, clutching a pillow. We gaze at each other and something passes between us. A promise. I'll find her friend. I turn to leave. I want to come, says Julianne. No, you wait here for the ambulance. Send Charlie back to bed. I take the torch from her cold fingers and turn at the gate. The river is hidden in the trees, 80 yards away. Swinging the torch from side to side, I peer over the hedges and into the neighboring fields. 
reaching a small stone footbridge and a wider concrete causeway, I shout Sienna's name. The road, unmade, single, with hedgerows on either side, leads out of the village. Why would she run? Why head this way? <laughs>